Welcome to the Mike Abadir Show. You'll want to sit tight this hour as hosts Mike Abadir and co-host Gino Bacola talk to the experts, celebrities, and figures from the worlds of sports and business of sports. We cover the NFL, baseball, basketball, soccer, and horse racing, so we have all of the bases covered. Now, we just need your participation. Here is your host, Mike Abadir. Welcome to the Mike Abadir Show. This is your host, Mike Abadir, and I am alongside my co-host, Gino Bacola. We've got a great show for you guys today. We have an NFL doubleheader. First, we've got Zach Wood from the New Orleans Saints, red hot first place team sitting at 10 and 4, have the tiebreaker over the Panthers because they beat them twice. And we've also got fan favorite from the Raiders of the 90s, Kenny Shedd, wide receiver. So we got a great NFL doubleheader for you guys today. Next week, we've, uh, we've got more football, but college football. We've got Monique Vig from, she's the parlay queen from Covers.com and America's Best Racing, as well as Rick Sar- Saratella from the Draft Bible. Gino, what is going on, my man? How are you? Yeah, I'm a little under the weather right now. I got that uh, that little flu that's going around, a little little uh, a little nasally. But it's, it's, that's what's nice with technology is that I don't have to be sitting next to you right now, Mike, infecting you. I can be at home. It's too late, to, my friend, because I'm already infected. I've got. Oh, you got it well, too. too. Uh-huh. Yep, that's why my voice sounds Everybody's like crap. And a little bit. I know. I'm, I know. I'm trying to just nip it in the bud right now because nobody likes being sick uh, during Christmas. So hopefully we can get rid of that. And we've we've started to see things really take shape in uh in the nfl and you know we saw the big game in the afc last week between the the steelers and the pats which was a really good game but as far as i'm concerned the nfc and and we're gonna be talking to zach in just a minute is so deep and it's such a fun looking conference this year it is just wide open honestly from top to bottom with you know with philly with minnesota with new orleans obviously and they are in such a tough division with the saints the panthers and the falcons all legitimately having a shot to get into the playoffs and then you have the rams and they just dismantle the seahawks but if you're talking one through six with like philly minnesota new orleans carolina atlanta and the rams that that's a anyone can beat anyone type group there and this looks like a really really fun year for the nfc with just a few weeks left before the playoffs you know it's really interesting too and i know i've been kind of harping on this for a long time we talked about it at great lengths maybe at the midway point in the season but it's crazy when you look at it in the nfc like you said wide wide open outside of drew Brees, i think the way it's looking if all the teams that are in playoff positions lock up their playoff uh you know standings if you will drew Brees might be the only one that's won a playoff game in the nfc out of the quarterbacks unless well, the seahawks you, get in with russell wilson you have you know. cam with carolina and oh that's right that's the, right i guess the real the, the real key is the nfc south because you'll have cam and you'll have matt ryan and those two guys are proven but they're not you know when cam is cam carolina is excellent i'm they're as good as anyone and defensively they were excellent last week too but the, it would well, be really with the funny. division leaders with you're, the division no, you're, leaders you're talking so about the Goffs and the keenums and right now nick Foles, who's yep. the, who's going to be the starter for uh for philly for the next for exactly. example, future so those exactly. would be the teams and and those, the, the key is those would be the teams with home field and with buys early so they're the teams that would would have the advantage and would be in the driver's seat to get to the Super Bowl. And then, you know, we're going to have uh, Zach on in just a minute, and it's going to be the Saints maybe having to go um, on the road. We'll see what the next few weeks look like. But but they're all so close. I mean, we're talking teams with two, three, and four losses with still a few games left to go. So there's still so much that can happen in the next few weeks as far as who's going to be having home games, who's going to be hosting what. Things are a lot more clear-cut in the AFC where we saw – you know, it looks like it's going to be now New England as long as they continue to hold hold on. Pittsburgh can't lay an egg in the next few weeks because, remember, they did lose to Jacksonville. So Jacksonville does have the tiebreaker over them. Which would be absolutely huge. The difference between playing in Florida and playing in Pittsburgh in the wintertime, I can't even begin to quantify what kind of difference that would be in terms of Jacksonville being able to make a run. And, uh, yeah, you're right. It's pretty more, pretty much more formful. I mean, to me, it looks like a one-horse race in the AFC with the Patriots. And then maybe... Some uh, some you know surprise surprise performances by Kansas City if they look like they're going to get their act together again, which they've kind of been starting to do the last couple of weeks, and then with the Jags because of their defense and the running game. And as you know, that's been my surprise team. I've kind of been riding on the Jacksonville Jaguars bandwagon on the radio, and it's been fun watching them progress. I still have a lot of questions about their quarterback, but 
yeah, you know, one horse race and we'll see who can come up and, uh, and, and strike at the wire, but it's the NFC. That's what it's all about right now. That's what's going to be the most intriguing conference in terms of who gets to the Super Bowl. Like I said, division leaders, only quarterback with a playoff victory is Breeze. And then you got some guys Super that Bowl can victory. win on the, or even, I think any playoff victory at all. I don't think well, there's anybody, any other Well, no, Atlanta and Carolina. Leaders. No, oh, no, the, but from the, the division, division leaders. leaders. Yeah, of the Correct. leaders. Correct. Yeah. And then we'll see who, who, who emerges out of the wild cards. And then, then you have the Matt Ryans and, and the Kim Newtons and Russell Wilsons, guys who all made it to the Super Bowl as well as Breeze. So you're looking at road teams that could probably go on and win. I'd be a little bit scared if I'm the division leaders right now. And why don't we get to uh, one of the most exciting teams so far this year? They've got the number one offense in the NFC, but it's not because of the passing game. That's what makes this team really interesting this year. I'm talking about the New Orleans Saints, and we're joined by Zach Wood from the Saints. He is their long snapper. He's also a defensive lineman, and who knows? Maybe we see him as a tight end in the future. Good afternoon, Zach. How are you, my friend? Hey, guys. How's, how's it going? Well, how about yourself? Oh, I'm doing really well. I can't complain at all. Uh, just, Good deal. You know, I got done with practice a couple hours ago, and now I'm just hanging out in the good old Zach, before we get into anything... Anything else? Curious. What's the difference in a practice schedule like for you? Um, and someone like you, who you're mainly special teams, but you do play a little bit else. Like, what's a normal practice day for you like? Are you do you take reps, you know, with a little bit of everything, or are you mainly taking, you know, doing stuff with the special teams? What's that kind of like for you? Well, at first, I was just doing special teams. You know, just coming in as a rookie snapper. That's what I want to focus on, and that's what the coaches want me to focus on. So. I didn't do anything but, you know, the punt period and then the punt return period as a scout team uh, snapper. So that's what I focused on. And uh, since I've kind of gotten in a groove, I've uh, kind of reached out and gotten a little bit of work on kickoff, kickoff return, you know, just to get me involved, get me moving around a little bit. And just recently this past week, I started doing individual with the linebackers, which has been great because it's going to help me out in coverage. So, um you know, it'll help me be a better coverage guy, so I'm not leaving my my team hanging out there, and I'm not just taking up space either. Good stuff. Now let's uh, let's st- let's start it from the beginning of this season. Your first game with the team was on Monday Night Football against the Vikings. Uh, you know that was a that was a difficult loss there. And uh, the following week, you guys put up an L once again. Started off 0 and 2. A lot of people were concerned about the direction of the season, and then all of a sudden, you guys went on a tear and went from an 0-2 team to a first-place team. What have been some of the factors for the team's success during this crazy run? Well, you got to remember that looking back, I mean, looking back now is that Minnesota is one of the top teams, and, uh, you know, the Pats are always good. You know, so we faced one of the two better teams that we play in the first two games. And I think it took us a little bit to find our groove, and I think we did that against Carolina. Um, and we kind of went, went went from one uh, week to week after that, you know, just kind of carried on that win with uh, Carolina, went to London and played Miami, and we kind of just went on a roll from there. I think everything started clicking. We, uh, everything, you know, we just found our niche, and uh, I think it all worked out. Yeah, you guys beat uh, Carolina by 21 in that game. That was in week three, and then went on uh, a few weeks later to beat them by 10 at home, getting that all-important season sweep, which, who knows, it could come down to uh, that tiebreaker advantage there. Yeah, exactly. So that's why it's even more important that we beat uh, Atlanta this week. Yeah, so you guys got Atlanta at home and then uh, wind up the season in Tampa. So you guys don't have uh, far travels, don't have cold weather to deal with. And uh, exactly, one, of the yeah. questions I was, yeah, one of the questions I was going to ask you a little bit later on in the interview, but I might as well ask it now is, you know, uh, you're playing obviously to be able to get as many home field games as possible. What kind of advantage has it been playing in the Superdome? Oh, it's huge, especially at least for my position. You know, as specialist, all we talk about is the weather for the game. You know, and to be able to play at the Superdome, playing it, playing indoors. You know, the weather's not a factor, obviously, so it's much more comfortable for you know me, Thomas Morstead, and Will Lutz uh, to be able to play our game when we don't have to worry about the weather. We can kind of just count on our on ourselves. You know, so that's that's nice, and uh, I'm hoping. You know, uh, I'm looking forward to playing in Superdome this weekend and then going down to Tampa in warm weather again to play. So I'm I'm just, you know, grateful that we don't have to go out in Philly or, you know, wherever else up north and play in that cold weather. So it's been nice. 
Yeah, it'd be absolutely huge. Now, Gino and I were talking about it. You guys are part of a pretty uh, a pretty special special teams unit. Uh, you know, your punter, Thomas Morstead, is a pro bowler, Super Bowl champ. Uh, Will is only 23 years old. You're only 24 years old. You guys both came into the league at the same time uh, last year. And uh, just got just want to know, how is it that you guys have been able to click so well so quickly? It's all come together very quickly as if you guys have been playing together for a long time. Long time. You know, I was telling Gino, I think and feel that you guys might be a part of the best kicking unit, special teams wise, in the entire NFL. What's been the secret? Oh, wow. I don't know. Um, I guess I would have to say Thomas has been the secret. You know, Thomas has been around for a while and he's definitely, you know, kind of helped mentor me and Will. And uh, it's been nice for me and Will because we're both, you know, similar ages. So we kind of connect and we actually room together. So. We're together all the time, so it kind of helps, you know, naturally build that relationship and trust with and within uh, each other. And to have Tom kind of, you know, be the old guy out there, kind of helping us out and giving us the right direction. It's been we've been able to mesh really well, and we get a lot of practice together. We enjoy our time together, so I think that's helped out a bunch. Zach, it's got to be a little bit exciting for you. You're a young guy, and you know, you look at some of the youth on this team just kind of going through the first four picks of the Saints draft. Marshawn Latimer, Ryan Ramchick, Marcus Williams, and Kamara. That's not a bad one through four. We're talking a couple pro bowlers and guys that are playing and really, really contributing. I, I think you mentioned it earlier. The top, the first two games of the season, you play really good teams, but you're young too, and you can really see this team improving and improving and improving. Um, it's got to be a, a fun, kind of exciting feeling when you have this youth mixed with a guy like Drew Brees. It seems like you are one of the more well balanced teams on both sides of the ball. Um, special teams, as we just mentioned, really, really well balanced all around. Have, have you ever been a part of a team, you know, at any level that's been so well balanced? Oh, no, I can't say that. I mean, I know I'm young, but even, you know, I've never really experienced a team like this because just the atmosphere in the locker room is terrific, you know. Everybody gets along, you know. And what I think is good is that we do have that kind of a gap between we got, you know, a guy like Drew Brees and we got some older guys around the room that can help mentor the younger guys. So there's not, there's kind of a little gap in between there when you got those star players on the rise that have, somebody they can look to and get advice from, like Drew Brees, you know, and uh, Drew's an awesome guy. He's helped out as much as he can with everybody. And I think it's just that everybody's been meshing well together and it's been it's been a good year, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons for it. What kind of leader is Drew Brees? Is he, is he kind of a vocal guy, or is he kind of more of a lead-by-example type? What, you know, what are what are some specifics that you could kind of share with, uh, with the audience as to, you know, giving us some insight into what Drew's like? Uh, I, I guess he's a little bit of both. You know, he's a vocal when he needs to be, but he's not overbearing. And he does lead by example. I mean, just for instance, um, one of the Saturdays after walkthrough, uh, you know, practice is over with, everybody's walking out the field. And I go into the weight room, and, and from the weight room, you can see uh, through windows into our indoor facility. And uh, Drew Brees is out there all by himself, you know, just going through his drops, his reads, just going down the field just all by himself. And I was, I sat there and watched for about 10 minutes. I was just blown away because he's been doing this for 16 years, 15, 16 years, and he's just still doing these little things that makes him one of the best to ever play, you know? And he may not know it, but people like me see that, and that inspires me to go do a little bit more, you know? And I don't know how many of my other teammates have seen that, but I know it's, you know, it's encouraged me to, uh, you know, it's put more trust in him for me to see that because that's that's amazing you know it's a uh, really easy kind of just to get in a routine and kind of forget those things but to see him do that after this long you know it's pretty pretty cool absolutely um well let's talk about the head on show now uh sean payton you were in you were in dallas in the preseason so you got a little taste of what jason garrett was like and now you've uh, you've been in new orleans with sean payton Kind of differentiate as you were doing with Drew Brees. What are some of the characteristics of those two guys as head coaches? Any similarities? Any differences between the two? Uh, I mean, both of them are very intense coaches. You know, um, I know back in Jason with Jason Garrett, he's you know both of them are incredible coaches, and Jason's just really really intense guy. You know, um, 
always spitting out the, you know, the good coaching quotes, you know, just knows every, all the X's and O's about football. And uh, he's very good at motivating the guys. Um, I think the difference between him and Sean Payton is, I mean, they both have those characteristics, but Sean Payton's, I think, a little bit more lenient and more relaxed, you know, more of a player's coach than uh, Coach Garrett, you know. He's always joking around and, you know, kind of, he likes to keep a relaxed atmosphere, just kind of his, like his personality in general. That's the kind of way he wants us to be around, you know, around him and around on the field. We we get our job done, but there's no, you know, you're not stressed out and watching every little move you make. So I think that's what's great about Sean Payton. And uh, you can tell that the players like that about uh, a lot about him. Yeah, that's got to be, uh, you know, probably a contributing factor when you're talking about starting off the season, you know, with, with a little bit of a road bump, it could go either way. It could get kind of spiral from there, or you can, um, you know, uh, take a, take a cue from your head coach being calm, cool and reserved, you know, um, keeping it loose atmosphere wise. I, I think that probably helps to, um, make sure that everybody kind of stays together, cohesive and uh, doesn't you right. know, put the pressure on. And I think that's probably going to be pretty huge going into the, the, the playoffs as well in terms of you have a coach who's, who's won, won a Super Bowl, won playoff games and knows how to keep things loose. I, I would think that's got to be a huge asset going into the playoffs. Oh yeah, definitely. Cause it's, it's really easy to see, you know, any nerves or, you know, seeing a coach stressed out, it kind of stresses you out as a player. It's like, man, if this guy's not right, you know, mentally and physically, like, how, how am I supposed to feel? But, you know, to watch Sean and, you know, how he just interacts with everybody and how he keeps us cool all the time, it just, you know, it makes you feel a little bit better that, you know, we belong here. He knows what he's doing. So, I mean, I can relax a little bit because I know what I'm doing, you know. So, it's, I, I think it's great. You know, Sean's an awesome coach. No, that's terrific. And, you know, speaking of coaches, before I ask you about your former SMU coach, Chad Morris, and the the new opportunity he's taken on, SMU. I mean, what what is it about SMU? You guys have been producing guys in the NFL um, at numbers that people probably don't realize, but specifically with the Saints. I mean, we were talking about more study your punter earlier, but what is it? Six guys from uh, from SMU that are on the Saints on the roster. Yeah, uh huh. That's right. Well, I, I mean, does that? Uh, I, like I said, I think that most people would be surprised to hear that statistic, but what is it about SMU? Is it the coaching, recruiting, uh, player development? Uh, you know, how, how, or is it a kind of a fluky thing that six ended up on the Saints? Or, you know, what do you think? And, and how has it been having, uh, you know, alums and former teammates with you on the same club at the NFL level? Uh, well, honestly, I think, I think a lot of it's the coaching, you know, SMU has sort of become a stepping stone for uh, a lot of coaches. So we'll, we'll get in a really good coach like Gene Jones. Gene Jones brought in a lot of good recruits, you know. And right before we started getting really, really good, you know, um, he left. And the same thing with Chad. You know, Chad brought in a lot of good recruits. I mean, um, you know, and we, we, got, we got better. We got at a higher level. And then, you know, unfortunately, he's gone. But I think uh, we SMU gets a lot of guys that are under the radar coming through high school, and uh, the coaches that we've had have been able to develop those guys um, into play, being really good football players. And I think that's been evident in the NFL right now because we got a lot of guys coming to the league, and I think we'll have a couple more next year just through uh, Chad's program. And uh, I'm excited to see it. And I'm pumped for SMU, and I hope we can, uh, you know, land a coach that will. You know, hopefully stay and not just be the stepping stone. And I'm I'm really pumped for Chad Morris because that's a awesome deal for him. You know he's really earned that and he's he deserves it. He works his butt off. And he's an awesome awesome coach. So yeah, great to see him in the to the SEC with Arkansas. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm real I'm real pumped for him. He's done a great job. He deserves it. Okay, real important question now. Probably the most important that we've had the the whole interview for you. It's the holiday season, okay. and we've been trying to uh, bring some flair in. What is your favorite Christmas movie? Oh, Christmas Vacation for sure. Oh, good one. Great answer. I like great Christmas answer. Day. Yeah, that's that's my dad's fault right there. Um, uh, you know, he, those are one of his favorites, so he always wa- wa- made me watch that. So yeah, that's got to be my top movie. Great. I have a trivia question that I'm going to ask Mike later on about that movie later on in the show. So you just, I should, I should be sending you a few extra bucks because that was a perfect teaser for a little later in the show. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead and send that money. Yeah. More. Well, is Christmas your favorite holiday or do you like the holiday season? 
Oh, yeah, I love Christmas. Uh, it's going it's to be a little harder this year because I won't be at home. Well, that's not true, but, um, you know, used to, you get like, a, I'm with my family for a while during Christmas, almost to where you're, you're kind of tired of them, you know, but now I'm getting like a, a day with them on Christmas day after the game. Sure. I'm going to fly back to Dallas and hang out with them, but uh, it's going to be a short break, but I'm going to enjoy it. That sounds good. Now, we've got a few seconds left. Uh, any, any 2018 resolutions or goals now that we're about to approach the new year? Uh, you know what? I haven't really thought of that. Uh, How about win the Super Bowl? I'll, I'll make one for you. There you go. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> if I'm not hoping for that, yeah. Jeez. That's definitely a good okay, one, that's for cu- sure. Cu- couple more rapid-fire questions, and then we'll let you go, Zach. So, uh, okay. do you have a favorite pregame meal? Pre-game meal, I like uh, I like scrambled eggs and oatmeal. Are you like a do. water Gatorade? What's your drink? What's your hydration? Oh. Energy drink. Oh, my energy drink. Okay, so I drink uh, this stuff called Celsius. It's like a nice little healthy energy drink. Energy drink to help pick me up. And what, what was tough for a little while is that I was taking all the other all, all the other energy, you know, whatever substance. Uh, supplements you can get and I just felt disgusting afterwards so bloated and everything and this one's just like a healthy pick me up you know just after like a good night's rest so I mean I feel great every time one of those uh, one of those before every game outstanding and and uh, finally any um any any charities that you've been involved with whether it be during the season or during the holidays that uh you you've enjoyed um you know partnering up with and giving back to the community for yeah so um actually Thomas Morstead has a uh foundation called uh what you give will grow and uh he's had a couple of little um outings with that and i mean just yesterday we went to the hospital and visited uh or gave gifts out to uh cancer patients or uh you know newborns uh, and their families for you know you know that are going through troubled troubled times right now so we try to go out there and you know cheer them up as best we can during the holiday season and give out some gifts Outstanding. Well, I hope all our listeners can uh, maybe Google that and uh, look look into the Thomas Morissette Foundation. Sounds like uh, he's doing, and you guys are doing great things for the community there. Best of luck this uh, playoff run, Zach. You know I'll be rooting for you. And full we'll disclosure for yeah, and full disclosure for our audience, I'm actually the agent for Zach Wood. I probably should have laid that out at the top of the show. <laughs> um, so I love Zach, and uh, little uh, I'm excited to to see what the Saints can do, and uh, hopefully end up in the Super Bowl. And so uh, we thank you, Zach, for joining us. Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year to you and your family and to the Saints organization. And uh, we'll be watching out. Oh, thanks a lot, guys. Merry Christmas to you all, too. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Zach. We'll take our first commercial break, and we'll be back with more football talk and Kenny Shedd of the Oakland Raiders. Think you've seen everything there is to see in online television? Let us surprise you. Visit voiceamerica.tv today for sports, health, business, and more on demand 24-7. If you're looking for more information on firearms and the shooting sports, check out Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan. Kelly is the owner of McMillan Fiberglass Stocks with over 40 years of experience. Now he's ready to share some industry luminaries and their perspectives with you. If you're interested in firearms, whether it be for shooting, for fun, competition, hunting, or self-defense, Kelly is here to share his wisdom and experience. Listen live for Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan, Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Sports Channel. Sports continues to grow and evolve to ever-increasing prominence in today's society. On All Around Sports, host John Inglesby will connect with the leading newsmakers from the sports world, including players, owners, and fellow sports journalists, discussing the top news and events that are relevant to sports today. John will also report from and offer his experience of the world's top sports events. Tune in to All Around Sports with John Inglesby on Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific on the Voice America Sports Channel. Your internet flagship station for sports, Voice America Sports. This is the Mike Abadir Show. If you want to call in today, we can be reached at 1-888-346-9144. That's 1-888-346-9144. Or send an email to mike at themikeabadirshow.com. 
Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back to the Mike Abadir Show. This is Mike Abadir and my pilot, Gina, or co-pilot, Gina Bacola, had to tap out. His uh, voice just couldn't handle it anymore, feeling ill, as am I. I'm just trying to power through it a little bit. I think I'm in a little bit of better shape than Gino is right now. So wishing uh, you to feel better, G. And uh, we'll we'll circle back up next week for our show with Monique Vig and Rick Ciratella from NFL Draft Bible. Let's get to our next guest. He is a former Oakland Raider, was a fan favorite, currently multi-talented police officer. He's a sometimes co-host of the Silver and Black Show. He's a Hollywood movie writer, producer, and director. I'm talking about none other than Kenny Shedd. Kenny, good morning. How are you, my man? (laughs) <laughs> that's, a lot of, uh, that's a great intro there, Mike. I really, really, really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank man of many titles and, ma- and many talents. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, our, my, my, my parents made us very motivated uh, kids. So, uh, you, know, you know, we only get one shot at this, so I'm trying to do as much as I can. Well, you're doing a really good job at it, man. And, uh, you know, you, you, you've covered a lot of ground. I, I think that, you know, when, when you ask kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, you'll hear, you know, fireman, police officer, NFL player, MLB player. Man, you, you got like half of those covered. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess you're right. You know, I mean, I, I, that's exactly what I wanted to be when I was growing up was a, was a police officer, mainly because my dad was a cop. Um, so I've been living the dream for the last almost 16 years, and it's an absolute kick in the pants job. And it's, it's amazing to me to even hear that, that timetable. Uh, you know, for our audience out there, Kenny and I go way, way back uh, into the you know, mid-90s, uh, really. We're talking about a time period when the L.A. Raiders had just moved back to Oakland. That was 1995, and uh, I, I was with the Raiders uh, for the first time in 1996, for those who have been listening since show number one, very first guest uh-huh. was uh, Morris Bradshaw, and I worked for Mo, uh, for those of you who remember, and he's still with the club right now, and he's been with the club forever and will be with the club forever. And uh, in 1996, <laughs> I worked for Mo, and uh, Kenny and I were, were uh, you know, teammates, if you will, in a, in a sense, uh, when I worked for the Raiders, and he was a uh, first year on, on the ball club. And... Uh, and so Kenny and I go back a long, long time. We've been involved with each other's, uh, you know, weddings and, and uh, have had a very deep friendship. And so this is really an honor for me to have Kenny on the show. And uh, I want to go back even a little bit prior to uh, the time when you and I had circled up with the Raiders and uh, mm-hmm. want to start with your college days, if, if, uh, if you don't mind. And yeah. uh, so Northern Iowa. Yeah. Small school, yeah. but produced some pretty big names from 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 the team that you were on, man. Uh, definitely, you know it's it's a smaller version of Notre Dame, but uh, you know it's it's called Northern Iowa, and it's uh, it sits in a little small town in in, in Iowa, Cedar Falls, uh, but it has the personality of a Big Ten school, which is fantastic. And it has. It, it's produced a lot of uh, NFL players of, uh, a lot before me. Uh, you may remember Bryce Pop, uh, uh, James Jones, uh, uh, Diedrich Ward, and, um, and surprisingly, which no one saw, uh, Kurt Warner, who turned out to absolutely um, blow the league away and become a Hall of Famer. It's, it's still mind-boggling. So what kind of quarterback was he in college? Uh, he was a he was a fantastic quarterback. I mean, um, in practice, uh, you know, in spring games, we had a chance to see him perform, uh, and every time he threw the ball, it was perfect. It was beyond accurate. Uh, as a receiver, there's nothing better than 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 that. I mean, you never had to stop and adjust to the ball. It was always it hit you in stride. Um, and Kurt came in at the same year that I did. Um, I ended up not redshirting as a and playing as a as a redshirt fre- as a freshman, true freshman. Uh, but Kurt, um, you know, came in the same time he redshirted. Um, but we all felt like at some point this guy should be out there starting because uh, he lit it up from the very beginning. But uh, there was somebody uh, that our head coach felt uh, more close to and com- comfortable with, and that person. Uh, who was a great quarterback? He started all four years over Kurt. 
Isn't that something? <laughs> I can't. Yeah, and um, you know, it's it's it, that's what sets the stage for one of the, the I mean, the best story, uh, Cinderella story in the NFL, I think, ever. Um, back in college, uh, we all felt so bad that Kurt was not playing, and it was nothing against uh, the starting quarterback. Jay was a great, great quarterback, but we just felt more of a connection with uh, Kurt. And we, it was like 11 of us, of us, not too many people know this, but 11 of us got together um, and we went to the, we had a, we set up a meeting with the head coach and we went in there and on Kurt's behalf to try to plead with him to be, uh, the, you know, get him to be the, the starter. And that's when the fight started. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen our, our coach go from, from uh, kind of pale, he's pale skinned anyway, but he went from pale to purple like that, and everybody got thrown out of the out of the office, and he was steaming mad, and you know it just needs to say it didn't go very well. Wow, isn't that that's yeah. an amazing story? And uh, yeah. you know you got to wonder, uh, you know, years later, you know how he felt about being the guy that <laughs> sat sat one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time uh, on on the bench. I'm not laughing, and I, you know, thank you for uh, letting letting it snicker out too, because it is kind of a funny <laughs> thing. I mean, uh, Coach Allen, he was a great, great coach. He was perfect for Northern Iowa. He was a he was funny. He let, made everybody feel comfortable, and um, you know, well and welcomed. It's just for some reason he didn't see what was in Kurt that we all kind of saw. And it's no slap against our head coach. Uh, you know, but we just knew something was very, very special about Kurt. And he wasn't the type of quarterback that would be in your face and loud. He just was very confident, very quiet, and he just did the, his job every single day. He was very patient, too. Um, um, so, and I've had a chance to follow him uh, after I went on and I played in the league. I, would, I went back, back to Iowa and I saw him in a couple no, Barnstormers games at the Arena League. So uh, I had a chance to follow him. Like, if this guy keeps on this route, he's going to blow up. So, and he did. Well, and you know what? That's a great example for you know any any young athlete or anybody in general about you know setting your goals and not losing sight of them, and you know being able to fulfill your dreams. You know, he didn't give up. Obviously, you know it's it's been well covered. You know that he played in the arena league and you know was stocking shelves uh, to make ends meet uh, at a grocery store or something or convenience store or something along those lines. Very well chronicled story. But you know, it's one of those stories. You know, kind of like Michael Jordan getting cut from the JV team. I mean, with those legendary type of scenarios where you look back years later and you're like, how did that guy get cut from the JV team? He's the greatest of all time. You know, and when you look yeah. back. You know, I had one of those, uh, you know, uh, sit sit downs with the NFL scout over a couple of beers where we just kind of had, you know, good, candid conversation, fun conversation. And he actually told me that in all his years scouting, he thought that the best two uh, passing quarterbacks of all time were Dan Marino and Kurt Warner. I mean, that's no way. real, wow. real lofty praise. Wow. And he said the same thing that you said, though, you know, uh, perfect spiral, perfect passer. Extremely accurate. Extremely accurate. Um, you know, and, and, and one a, more thing, by the way, not to interrupt you, but there was yeah, a lot okay. that had to happen in order for him to even get a shot with the Rams. I mean, that's what's fascinating about this story is, you know, if, if, if Trent Green doesn't go down in, in preseason, we may not even know who Kurt Warner ever it was or became. It, it, so everything exactly. kind of had to happen perfectly. Yeah. Or imperfectly. It's, it's just all... It fell in place like that. Um, it's a, it's a, it's it's uh, you know it, 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 you can't write that type of script out. Um, and he's very humble person be, by all that. Um, you know he has a great great story. I think there's going to be a movie coming out um, here soon. I saw him um, about a year ago, and he was telling me that they were in the process of filming his story. So uh, soon it's going to be out on the uh, you know in the theaters. I was just going to ask you if you still kind of keep in touch periodically with Kurt. Obviously, he's got some uh, pretty pretty cool responsibilities with the NFL Network, and he's done done a great job on the broadcasting side. But you guys stay in touch uh, periodically. Yeah, um, we. I, I didn't get a chance to go up for the his Hall of Fame induction, but about uh, twelve 
uh, or so uh, former uh, Northern Iowa Panthers have, were all in contact with me and everybody and, and Kurt and, and everybody made arrangements to go up there to support him. Uh, but I got a chance to watch uh, the, the events from the night and it was just it was a proud, proud moment. Uh, because I remember him being in, 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 um, in, in uh, you know, a freshman in college, in, in college writing class, and he was just a super, super cool dude. He'd do anything for you and um, just never overbearing on anything, but he was just a true professional. Fascinating stuff, and uh, we could probably spend a lot of time talking about it, but I know we got a lot of people from Raider Nation that tune in and listen, so I uh, want to kind of fast forward a little bit, um, you know, jumping past your time with the, the Jets and, and the Bears, and we'll circle up on, mm-hmm. on something relating to, to the Bears in a, in a few moments, um, yeah. uh, and then obviously, you know, you had a stint with the uh, Barcelona Dragons in, in Europe, and, 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 then, and then you got your opportunity with the Oakland Raiders. Um, I know, like I said earlier, you know, having spent time there, I know how much you, of, a, of a fan favorite you were. And, um, you know, we could we could talk a little bit about that and how you endeared yourself to the Black Hole and Raider Nation. But what the yeah. thing that I think when I look back and I think about those years, I think of, of this and, and I want to see if you agree or not. 1996, your club went seven and nine and 97, four and 12 and 98 and 99. Eight and eight, eight and eight, and I look back at, at the names involved. Now, the first couple of years, you know, you had uh, Jeff Hostetler and and then Jeff George, and and then later on Rich Gannon. But we're talking about Hall of Famers and Pro Bowlers, Tim Brown and yourself and Daryl Hobbs, James Jett, Ricky Dudley, Napoleon Kaufman, Harvey Williams, Derek Fenner, Lincoln Kennedy, Kevin Gogan, Barrett Robbins, Chester McLaughlin, Lorenzo Lynch, Greg Beaker. Larry Brown, James Trapp, Nolan Harrison, Andre Bruce, later on, <laughs> Eric Turner and Desmond Howard and Daryl Russell and John Ritchie and Charles Woodson and Calvin Branch and Tyrone Wheatley and Zach Crockett and Eric Allen. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Ridiculous names. How did these clubs subperform like that? I mean, th- that should be four straight playoff, you know, Super Bowl contending type teams. And I know, by the way, that the kicking issue was huge at that time as well. Well, you know, and, and you just made my, my, just, just made my heart just rush when you were putting those names out there because, you know, on paper, that's a Super Bowl winning uh, team right there. Um, and uh, you're, you're right. I, there is no real explanation behind that. But I was, when I played, I saw something um, out there that really, uh, you have to really kind of be on the team to kind of see. And a lot of people who, um, you know, you know uh, are on the outside, they didn't really kind of key in on the fact that, that the, you know, people were out to get the Raiders. Um, you know, there's example, of, uh, exa- there's example after example of uh, just plays that just went against the Raiders' way. I mean, it's hard to win in the NFL anyway, but when you got uh, referee staff that are coming up with ghost calls um, in a very, very tight, close game where it's coming down to a field goal and the other team gets a penalty that, uh, on, a, on a pass interference where that re- defender wasn't even close to that receiver – there's a problem with that, um, and uh, I saw it when I played uh, because there was just no excuse for us to lose some of those games that we were losing, and um, and I pinpointed it right away what was going on is we were being uh, you know we were being ousted by by some horrible calls. Um, I if if it were me if I had any type of a uh, the say so the you know the Raiders organization would put together all the different games, uh, but they would use the footage from the TV telecast that you see on the national TV because the commentators are seeing what, what everybody else is seeing. Are you kidding me? Why did they throw that flag? He didn't even touch him. And, it's like, and there's like at least three or four games a year that it's like that, and it turns the Raiders' seasons around completely. Um, I saw it again this year with the Washington game. So until they get that fixed, Raiders are going to be snake bitten a little bit. Yeah, I mean, during that time period, I think uh, it, the, the Raiders are flagged more than any other team. I think, what, like eight years in a row or 10 out of 11 years or something crazy like that. I mean, it was 
it was uh, it was probably more than excessive. And uh, I, I remember, and Mo and I laugh about this every once in a while. I'm not sure if you remember this, Kenny, but there was a uh, a front page headline in the Oakland Tribune uh, somewhere during that time period uh, where it had a voodoo doll. And uh, and it asked the question in the headline: Are the Raiders uh, cursed or hexed or something like that? And it sure seemed like it, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I mean you you can never you can never prove it, but um, you know, I, I, like I said, I saw it. I, something wasn't right when I played, and then you know when I uh, re- retired, I'm watching the games now on TV and. And some of the calls that were happening were where guys are getting called for tripping, and then you watch the replay, and not, nothing even close to that happened. Um, you know, I can go on and on about that. And so I, I, I applaud the Raiders team even this year. They're more than likely not going to be going to the playoffs, but I applaud their effort um, because they're 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 getting. Uh, they're getting ousted by some horrible ref calls that they can't control. And that's an unfortunate situation. It sure is. Now we've got about a minute before we get to break. And uh, after mm-hmm. the commercial, we'll, we'll kind of focus more on, uh, on today's game and today's team and, and some of the issues confronting the NFL, but quick rapid fire yeah. question for you, the three quarterbacks, the starting quarterbacks that you played with, uh, Jeff Hostetler, who obviously had won a Super Bowl with the Giants. Jeff George, who was a first pick for the Colts and had a crazy physical talents and, and, and you know, a prototypical NFL quarterback. And then Rich Gannon, who achieved the most success with the Raiders, you know, uh, in the early 2000s. Who, who, is, who is the best passer or best quarterback out of the three when you played? Well, I have to, you know, I have to give props to Jeff George. Um, great guy, and um, uh, he'll take care of you. And he actually was, had a hand in getting me signed for my last year in the NFL with the with the Redskins. His his him vouching for me alone got me uh, signed with that team. Uh, but oh, on an overall scale, in terms of leadership, uh, ball accuracy, and um, you know ability to run the offense in an efficient, fast manner, is Rich Gannon. He was he was a perfect role model at the quarterback position. Wow, that's good stuff. Well, let's take our, uh, our, our, our first commercial break with, with, uh, with you uh, being uh, our, our guest. And then uh, after the break, we'll uh, continue the conversation with Kenny Shedd and talk about some of the current issues that are confronting the Raiders and, and the NFL and uh, the current climate of the league. And we'll catch that after this short commercial break. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Okay, sports fans, here's your opportunity to discuss football, America's favorite sport. On an annual basis, millions of people attend, watch, and listen to football, both pro and college. Ray Ellis Sports, an internet talk radio show, was developed with the fan in mind. Join host, former Philadelphia Eagles and Cleveland Browns strong safety, Ray Ellis, on Voice America Sports every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific for exciting, interactive football discussions from the fan's perspective. Tune in every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific to Ray Ellis Sports right here on the Voice America Network and let's talk football. Get ready for the Get Down with Hurley Brown. Want to get inside of the minds of the players and coaches? We'll talk everything sports, but with a focus on the NFL, NBA, and college football. We'll review and preview the week's big games. We'll talk about the draft choices and free agents and go inside the teams for news, recruiting, and what's next from the colleges to the pro teams. It's the Get Down with Hurley Brown, Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 noon Pacific, on Voice America Sports. Your internet flagship station for sports, Voice America Sports. This is the Mike Abadir Show. If you want to call in today, we can be reached at 1-888-346-9144. That's 1-888-346-9144. Or send an email to Mike at the Mike Now, back to this week's program. 
Welcome back to the Mike Abadir Show. We're having a barbershop conversation with Kenny Shedd, former Raider, and uh, just a, a great interviewer, uh, fascinating stories. We've been taking a stroll down memory lane and talking about some of the Raider teams from yesteryear and uh, want to kind of shift the focus to uh, the current team. And, uh, you know, obviously underperformed, expectations were high going into this season. There were uh, many, many experts, Super Bowl pick, and for good reason, especially, you know, Carr coming off, of, you know, big contract extension and high expectations and, you know, they've got all the pieces together, yet they're sitting at six and eight in third place in, in a down AFC West. What, what's going on, Kenny? I mean, what, what, why, why is this, this team not, uh, you know, a one or two seed in the AFC? Well, uh, from, from, you know, I mean, uh, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is, is just they don't have the energy. They don't have the, 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 the rallying cries and the, the in-your-face, let's-get-going type uh, mentality and that, that, I've, that I've seen. Uh, from like former Raider teams that went to the Super Bowl, um, you know, other teams that might not be the Raiders who are, have won Super Bowls, they all rally around each other. Someone will make a big play, and they're like all in each other's face, and they're loving each other, and it's just nonstop hustle. Uh, and I don't see that um, on a consistent basis from um, from this team. And to me, it's really no surprise why they have the record that they have because. You know, uh, every team you face is going to have just as many weapons as you. And the, one of the main things that kind of helps teams stand apart is their their energy level. Uh, you know, I I remember one time um, when I was hurt when Al Davis was alive, and we were in Buffalo. Or I'm sorry, we were in uh, Baltimore. Uh, Al Davis was up watching the sidelines, and then the Raider team was going there their pregame warmups and stuff. And the Ravens were like on fire. The Raiders were, like, just dead. And Al, I'm in street clothes. Al Davis grabbed me. Kitty, get out there. Get those guys revved up. And he grabbed me <laughs> and threw me out in the field. I was like, what can I do? And I, I, could, I knew exactly. You could just see the, the angst in his face because he knew his team was going to get blasted. And sure enough, they went out there and got killed. And it translates even to today. If you go out there dead, you're going to get blasted. It's just simple uh, football 101. Well, and I, and I know that uh, many people in the Bay were kind of hoping for that Cinderella story, especially after the, you know, the news came out that the team was going to be re- relocated to Las Vegas. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, to me, the Raiders belong in Oakland. You know, uh, I'm still struggling with, uh, you know, Las Vegas Raiders. I'm sure they're going to do fine and do, do real well. And they're going to have uh, maybe a broader reach, but how how is the community in the, in the East Bay handling this, and uh, and how do you feel about it? Well, uh, Mike, um, I, uh, I I'm one of the few I think who has the ability to kind of kind of see things from both sides because I was part of the the group that they formed, uh, the Save Oakland Sports Group. It's mostly consists of fans and. Uh, politicians, uh, the mayor, Mayor Kwan was was big, and and, and her uh, staff were big at that time in it. So when this new stadium issue started kind of being talked about, I was in meetings with the mayor's office, in, with the mayor in their office, um, and then so they're talking to Raider personnel. Not necessarily the Raider personnel were there, but I knew about conversations that were back and forth, back and forth. Um, so I knew. The, the, the city was doing the, what they could. And then at the same token, you would hear, uh, you know, Mark Davis say publicly, we want to stay in Oakland. We want to stay in Oakland. For years he would say that. So you have both sides just saying, you know, verbally, we want to work together. We want this type of stadium. With a, you know. But after four or five years of saying that and nothing's happening for whatever reason, you know, I mean, the, the owner of the team has no choice other than to look at other options. So it's hard for me to kind of throw anything in um, the Raiders organization's face because they, they, they did what they could. But, uh, you know, I, I, was making, I was making light of it like, you know, the, the, the city of Oakland's going to wait to the last minute to ask the girl to the dance. 
And I, I, that might have been what happened because someone else is going to come on in and say, hey, you want to dance? And that seems like what's, what's, what's happened. And um, uh, Las Vegas, is, they're not going to let this opportunity slip away, and they're going to they're gonna take full advantage of, of bringing the Raiders in. Well, it'll, 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 it'll give me one more excuse to, to, to take road trips to Las Vegas, at least, you know, <laughs> so that, that's at least one benefit, you know, and I'm sure we're all going to get used to it. But I, I do feel badly for the people of the Bay Area. Obviously, the A's are having yeah. some issues as well and are going to have to, you know, I, I, I hope that they're able to find a solution to keep the A's in Oakland because uh, it would be an absolute shame to have Golden State playing in San Francisco and then, uh, you know, the Raiders and the A's who have been mainstays in the region since, you know, the 60s to uh, no, no longer be there. So I'm rooting for Oakland, man. I, I hope uh, I hope things work out with, with the team before they move. And, uh, you know, we'll obviously have to look towards next year. But that that yeah. gets me to, to my next thought, which is, you know, back back in, back when you played, which relatively speaking wasn't that long ago, but it seems like the NFL was an entire wor- a world of difference in terms of, you know, it was about being tough and get back in the game oh, yeah. and, and play through pain and no pain, no gain. And and uh, you, you almost really couldn't tell a coach uh, in, in anything r- relating to, to being hurt unless you were truly injured, you know, and it seems like it's a very different mentality today so my first question for you is, has the NFL kind of softened up, and, and is, is there a good reason for that? <clears throat> well, I, yeah, the, it, it's hard to argue against that, that it has uh, softened up. I mean, if you go, uh, if you see some of the training camps now, uh, it's, 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 it kind of throws you off because there's very few two-a-days, uh, if there are any two-a-days, and you only get a certain number of days where you can even wear pads. Um, and, and I think the training camp is even shorter now. So back when I played, those <laughs> um, it was grueling. And um, you kind of had to kind of dust and knock off the, the rust and kind of get at each other to get the, get the feistiness going on. Uh, I personally don't believe how you can how you can um, play a game as fast and as kind of physical as, as NFL football when you're not revved up and energized. It just it doesn't work, and, you, and it's nothing that you can just, like, turn on just like that. So uh, if, I, if, if you look around, it sounds to me like there's some um, – and maybe it's teams like the Patriots. I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's, there's things that they're doing – uh, on the low that, that kind of makes their guys a little bit more, you know, feisty and kind of bending the rules a little bit because it's hard to have a uh, no-contact rule when in practice and then all of a sudden you go out there and gain speed and then now it's full speed smacking into each other and you it's just very, very difficult to do it like that. Sure. So I would be about, yeah. Uh, I, would, I was just going to say, and I think a lot of this clearly stems from the concussion issue. You know, um, you know, they're, they're trying to kind of, you know, minimize the concussions. And, you know, obviously there's been a lot of bad PR for the NFL. You know, they may or may not have known certain things and uh, hidden certain things. And, you know, obviously player safety is now at the forefront of, of people's minds, whether it be in the media, fans or the players themselves. If I could ask you a question point blank, Kenny, how many concussions do you remember suffering during your time, and did any of them get reported or dealt with from a protocol perspective? Well, um, for the sake of, uh, you know, it, it's probably a question I probably can't really want to a- answer right now. Okay. Um, but but I can tell you that that it's 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 not just getting knocked out completely. Um, <clears throat> Um, you know, you get you just get your bell rung out there when you're going in to try to make a tackle. I remember being in Denver and you know, uh, as as a gunner going down there and, 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 and you know tracking down the punt returner, and I came in for the tackle, and I'm not the biggest guy anyway, and I but I tried to smack him as hard as I could, and you know before I can bring him down to the ground, I get smacked from behind from my other guys, my teammates. And I just remember going bing and have that numbness and the, like, whoa, okay. And there's just, it's hard to avoid that. So almost on every play, you're, you're, you're getting that, you're getting your bell wrong. You don't necessarily yeah. have to get a concussion. You're just getting your bell wrong. 
Sure. Well, and 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 since we we have a, I mean, this has flown by. We've got about a couple minutes before the the end of the show. I mean, let me oh. ask you directly. I mean, what kind of toll has the the game taken on you? Well, um, you know, I mean, you know, you, you just you, you back in the days, you you uh, you know, I mean, it it hasn't. I still feel like I can get out there um, and kind of. I uh, actually we did a like a, a like a guest coaching. Uh, for a seven-on-seven seven, um, event, uh, Raiders versus 49ers. So, I, so you know, I mean, I feel like I can get out there and kind of hang with these young guys still, but it just takes you almost an hour or plus more to get all <laughs> <Yeah>. warmed up. <laughs> and you got to sit and, down probably after every play. <laughs> sure. Well, what about the impact on maybe some former teammates? We've got about a minute and a half left here. Well, um, I, unfortunately, I... Uh, I had a, I had to see my former teammate of mine, uh, Rasham Salam, uh, who who uh, passed, who actually he killed himself this past year, or, um, and um, just seeing, I know what he was going through. I think a lot of that had to do with concussions. Uh, his brother even said so. So mm-hmm. um, you know, there's there needs to be more resources to, that that these wounded warriors can can kind of go to uh, psychiatrists who understand, you know, what these guys are going through because it's, it's a huge jarring effect to go from being this superstar guy who's given up his body and everything to make plays for his team to being someone who's, who's un- unemployed, no one sees him in the limelight anymore, and now you've got some lingering effects from all the banging around that you've had out there. Uh, yeah, you, you, you know it. It makes things very, very difficult, and he couldn't. He couldn't handle it, and he he made a, the ultimate to, uh, choice. So uh, yeah, terrible, so, terrible yeah, story. Obviously, it. very difficult to uh, to even hear hear you recollect about that. I'm sure, and uh, you know we we have about 45 seconds left, and I and I kind of wanted to both end on a positive note but also use this as a, as a segue to inviting you back again. I think a lot of people out there probably want to hear about some of the things that you're doing Hollywood-wise, uh, a lot of big projects that you've worked on, you know, Hidden Secrets and Karma and Balloon Rescuer. Uh, you know, I'm sure people can, can do some Googling and, and look into that. Uh, but w- yeah. can, can we use this as an opportunity to pick up the convo and invite you back on again and, and have maybe a little bit more of a focus on, on some of the projects you're working on? I would love to. Uh, we're working on our first feature called Iowa's Finest. It's about uh, uh, two, Iowa, two small town Iowa boys who ditched the farm to go to the big city to become uh, big, uh, big city cops. Um, and our catchphrase is hilarity ensues. <laughs> so we're all excited about how that's coming together. Um, you know, we're linking with some L.A. film uh, makers, um, something we haven't had before. And um, we're just getting bigger and bigger as we, as we go. That's good stuff, man. Well, we're up against the clock. So thank you very, very much to Kenny Shedd for a fantastic and candid conversation. And thank you for the listeners. And we will see you guys next week, same time, same place. Have a good one. Thanks for joining us this week for the Mike Abadir Show. Please tune in again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time for another show with Mike and his co-host, Chino Bacola, on the Voice America Sports Channel. Have a great week.